All right, thank you, thank you. All right, good evening, hello. Uh, today we're gonna talk a little bit about how open source has kind of changed the Java platform and hopefully uh, show you some fun projects and stuff you'll want to get involved with. All right, that is not, oh, here we go. Wow, that's a weird burn-in. Okay, uh, so in this talk, we're gonna talk a little bit kind of leading up to OpenJDK. What led us there? What were the pressures that kind of brought us to that point? It's very slow. There we go. Okay, one moment. All right, we'll talk about how open source has changed the Java platform for the better, generally. Uh, I'll show off a few key projects, things that I re think are really cool that have come out of the open source Java world. Uh, look at where we're going with this and what we can do to get involved, what sort of stuff is out there to play with. And we'll talk about what you can do to get involved. And I'll show a little bit uh, of some of the projects that I think would be interesting for folks here to, to play around with. Okay, so a little pre prefix here, uh, talk about why this is actually important. Uh, who has been developing long enough to remember when almost all of the development tools we used were closed source? This is, this is largely how it was in the 90s. Like it was not, uh, not unusual that everything in your stack, from, including the operating system, if you're running on say Solaris or Windows, was all closed source. It's almost unfathomable to us now that an entire platform that we build an application on would be closed source. And this pressure has been building up for a long time. Or how about when uh, those companies that build these different platforms, uh, different application servers, different runtimes, how, how about when they just don't away? Now the software's gone. They don't release it in open source. We've got nothing to do except migrate off of their software. Uh, or how about when you were debugging something and it turned out it wasn't your fault? Well, you're stuck. You have to work around it in some way. All of these things have been contributing over the years, pushing people towards doing more open source. Uh, and finally, it started to get into Java world, and we actually started to get the, the open source that we wanted. So my, I have a strong opinion, at least up to the level of application runtime, like your JVM or your .NET runtime, that should all be open source. Uh, Microsoft has at least figured out that the runtime needs to be open source for them to be competitive in this world. They're missing out on lots of folks that can contribute to stuff, and debugging-wise, being able to have a fully open source runtime for .NET, they've, they've realized the importance of this. It took them a little longer than all of us to figure it out, uh, but this is the way it should be. Everything that you build your application on top of should be based on open source. Okay, so I said the pressure has been building for this for a long time. We'll talk about some of the early efforts to build uh, open source Java. Uh, so, so Java itself came out 96, 97 ish. Uh, very quickly after the first release of Java, uh, there were a number of research projects to build open source versions of it. Uh, Cacao was one of the earliest ones. Uh, if you've ever seen any of the talks by Chris Thallinger on Grawl or Hotspot, he was actually in university and worked on Cacao. Uh, so, this is an academic project. It came out very shortly after the first version of Java. Uh, and this was actually the first JIT for Java, the first native compiler. It actually didn't have any interpreter, so uh, it would wait until you called a method, then generate the binary code, and that was as jitty as it got. But it was significantly better performance than the early uh, Sun Java runtimes. Uh, and like, like most of these early JVMs, because there was no open source class library, you had to find a way to plug a separate external class library in, like from the JDK or later on from ClassPath. Uh, JamVM uh, came along somewhat later. Now this is actually an interesting one uh, because of the size. This was implemented to be an extremely small JVM. The executable size on an Intel platform is only 80 k kilobytes. And of course, that's not counting all the class libraries, but even the Java, DLL, and executable are many, many megabytes compared to that. Uh, so this is cool for doing embedded stuff. It's even still being developed, uh, and there's, there's a lot of cool little things you can look at in this code base, too. Uh, anybody heard of the Jikes RVM? This is another big one that came along in the 90s. Uh, in 97, this was an effort by IBM to basically build a Java VM in Java. It was the first metacircular, uh, self-hosted JVM implementation. Uh, and this has inspired a lot of projects over the years. Uh, a little bit later, I'll talk about the Maxine project, which was another effort by Sun to do the same thing. Uh, and in general, this showed how much we could actually do implementing Java in Java, and later on starting to see the benefits of optimizations too. Uh, GNU ClassPath, uh, this came along a little bit later. This was trying to address the issue of not having class libraries. Uh, so we were able to build very 
simple and quick Java VMs in open source pretty easily. Uh, they came along one right after the other. If you go look at uh, Wikipedia for the list of JVM implementations, there's dozens and dozens of them. Uh, every, every student that went to school for compilers in the 90s made a Java VM. Like, this was the thing to do. Because it was an open spec, and it was popular, and it was uh, buzzword compliant. So there's lots of little JVMs out there. Uh, but there was no class library. Much larger task, obviously, to implement the entire Java class library. And that's where GNU Class Path came in. They realized there was this big gap. Uh, the F Free Software Foundation decided that this was an, a huge priority for them to get this open source class library. Um, and this did not have a VM of its own. Obviously, they knew at this point that there were plenty of other options of open source JVMs to plug into this. And most of these all just work with Class Path or with OpenJDK. They're, they're wired up that way. Uh, now, the interesting thing about some of these early VMs is because they were implemented uh, for either academic or totally free software purposes, they're not encumbered with uh, weird copyrights and patent issues. Uh, it's actually maybe a little safer to go learn about how the JVM works by looking at some of these early VMs. Uh, this is a snippet from ClassPath. Uh, this is the, some of the C code that actually implements the native side of a, uh, a, an AWT button. Code's very clean throughout the whole project. Uh, and you can go and poke around and figure out how JNI is implemented, how their GCs are implemented, and how the different classes work without worrying about tainting yourself with an Oracle patent or an IBM patent or something. So it's, it's pretty, pretty uh, clean code to take look through. All right, so I mentioned uh, the Maxine VM a little earlier. Uh, so this, this was a very cool project, and this, this is going to have lasting effects on the JVM because of the Graal compiler that came out of it. Uh, 2005, uh, some folks at Sun Microsystems uh, uh, Labs, the labs department, uh, decided that they would try to do their own metacircular VM, like the Jikes RVM, implementing everything in Java. And this means even the, the JIT implemented in Java, the garbage collector and memory management implemented in Java through all sorts of weird compiler tricks and annotations. Uh, but this actually did work. They had a fully functional JVM with a pure Java GC, pure Java JIT, all the JNI implementation done in pure Java. Uh, but it took a long time. Uh, I don't think they were really able to run a full-size Java application until at least 2008, 2009. Uh, and even beyond that, performance-wise, they didn't quite get to the point of uh, a standard hotspot OpenJDK performance uh, during the lifetime of the project. Uh, but it's very cool, and it set the groundwork for what's going to be the future of Java, I believe. Uh, this was shut down in about 2013, but it is still active, and there is still, active, still development going on to improve it, uh, improve the GC and the JITs and so on. And I'll talk more about Graal later as, as some of the future stuff going forward. Now, this is some of the weird stuff that you find if you take a look through Maxine. Uh, there's all these funky, uh, funky annotations, which it uses to optimize these all down to native code. So it knows that this is supposed to be inline, it forces that to inline, or it knows that there's a particular piece of assembly code that should go in that place. So in this way, this is a, a snippet from the pointer class. So here's, all, here's part of your memory management, the, the raw native memory management implemented in Java for Maxine. Uh, and the, the tools and this sort of, it's kind of like a, uh, like a dialect of Java for Maxine, uh, it's usable for other things. They can compile these things down into a native executable, so you can write using the Maxine annotations and get native executables out of it uh, with no garbage collector and with full memory management. That's the kind of cool stuff that you still can do with Maxine today. But it is weird code to look at. Uh, all right, so let's go to something a little, that was a, a little bit more practical and, and a little bit more controversial, uh, Apache's Harmony implementation. Uh, so, of course, everything that Apache does needs to be business-friendly licenses, and the GPL that was typically used for Java VMs and for ClassPath was totally incompatible with the way they wanted to do things, with the Apache license, with being business-friendly. Uh, so they ended up starting their own project to implement their own set of class libraries and VM uh, in about 2005. Much more effort focused on the class library, of course. The, the VM that they wrote never really got to a production quality, uh, but they did get a very high quality set of class libraries. Uh, 
it's kind of funny that this was originally intended to bring all of these different open source Java developers together into one project. Uh, but it kind of ran into some issues I'll talk about in a sec here, dealing with Sun Microsystems. Uh, like I say, very high quality library, 99% compatibility. It, it picked up before it was finally uh, abandoned. Uh, and this has lived on as the basis of the Android class libraries, at least up through uh, Android Nougat. All the Harmony libraries that Apache developed were those Java libraries on Android. Uh, since, Nougat, uh, 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 since Nougat Android has been moving more towards actually using OpenJDK's classes now. So what is the problem with why didn't Harmony become the open source JVM? Well, so the problem was this technology compatibility kit. If you wanted to have a JVM and say that this is Java compliant and put that coffee cup on your web page, you had to be able to run the Java technology compatibility kit, the TCK. The TCK, unfortunately, was closed source. So that's strike one against Apache using it. They're not going to license some closed piece of software to validate their open source version of, uh, of Java. Uh, other licensees were able to get access to it. Obviously, Azul can access it. IBM can access it. But because of the ways they dealt with the licensing and releasing of the TCK, you had to either be a closed source implementation like J9 or Zing, or you had to be derived from OpenJDK itself. Uh, and the, the real issue here was that the TCK was such a big mess of code contributed by dozens of different businesses over the years that it would have been many orders of magnitude more work to open source all of this, vet all that code, relicense all that code, and get it out there. And a lar large portions of it, they might never be able to get relicensed because the company's gone that contributed it to the, t to, the, to the kit, or that they just don't want anything they've worked on to be out in the open source to show how their applications failed on Java, for example. So the TCK is even today still difficult to access, uh, but more and more tests are being written in the open. This was not purely a malicious thing by Sun to prevent Apache from winning, maybe a little bit because they didn't want them to beat their JVM, uh, but it, is, it was a more of a licensing hassle. So this problem is still, issue, still an issue, but uh, it's improving over time. All right. So this brings us up to actually when we have OpenJDK. Uh, so the idea of open source in the JVM world finally takes hold after a good decade of having closed source Java with a ton of little one-off JVM implementations, uh, Sun finally in 2006 announced that they were going to be open sourcing Java in the next release. Uh, and this was very exciting. This is the year that I joined Sun Microsystems to work on JVM language stuff. So it was, it was a great time. I was big into open source. Sun was big into open source. We were going to make it happen. Uh, in May of 2007, they released an, op uh, an open source version of the JDK that was about 96% pure. There were still some closed source binaries that you needed to download and plug into it, uh, bits and pieces they couldn't release, like uh, font management, some of the, the uh, UI and graphics stuff, uh, a few other little pieces that they depended on closed source proprietary code for. Uh, yep, that was the plugs. The third party license code couldn't easily be relicensed. Uh, but but by, by April 2009, those plugs were optional, and then by 2010, shortly before the release of Java 7, it was actually fully open source. There were no more closed source dependencies in the JDK. Uh, and so this was, then, the first really TCK compliant open source runtime. Uh, Harmony might have been able to get there first if they had been able to access the TCK, but officially this is the first actual open source Java. So it continues from there. The, con the community continued to grow. They started to realize the value of OpenJDK. Uh, and folks like Red Hat obviously jump on board immediately. We want to be able to uh, have an OpenJDK that works on Red Hat Linux. Uh, we don't want these binary plugs. So some of the first replacements for those closed source pieces came from Red Hat as part of the Ice-T project. Uh, then it started to, the ball started to roll really fast at this point. IBM joined OpenJDK in 2010. Uh, they had been big, pack, big backers of Harmony. They wanted a business-friendly license on an open source runtime. They had been backing Harmony as the, the one that was going to win as far as open source Java. Once they moved over to OpenJDK, this basically killed Harmony. This was the point at which the Harmony developers had a vote. They said, are we going to continue doing this now that there's OpenJDK and we've lost IBM? The vote was like 20 to 2 to just cancel the project. So this was the death of Harmony right here. 
And then continuing on, Apple decided they didn't want to be maintaining their own version of the JVM, so they joined the effort. Uh, and almost all of the little Mac, and Mac OS plugs and, and specific pieces, like GUI stuff and whatnot, that they had done for their version of the JVM, they helped Sun put into uh, the actual OpenJDK. So we got a lot of code from Apple to make OpenJDK work well on Mac. And now it is an official supported platform of OpenJDK, of course. Uh, yep, Kogo Carbon Pinings, the GUI stuff, for example. Uh, and then other folks can continue to come along. SAP being a huge user of Java in 2011, they joined. They've contributed a ton of optimizations back, a whole bunch of weird platforms you're never going to use. Uh, but you know, good stuff, good stuff to expand the platform. And they're still one of the biggest contributors. Uh, talk to those guys at FOSDEM every year, and they've got all sorts of crazy new compiler optimizations every time I talk to them. So that's, that's great. This is showing how we're really starting to benefit from having open source J JDK and all of these different companies contributing to it. Uh, so here's uh, from OpenHub, which used to be Olo. Uh, they analyze open source projects by looking at their re repository, tracking how many commits and how many users they have, and so on. Uh, and this shows you, from the time that OpenJDK was open sourced, more and more contributors over time. Uh, these big spikes obviously being uh, like JDK 8 time frame, JDK 9 time frame, and now things picking up It'll probably wiggle around a lot more with the rapid release cycle that we have with 10 and 11 and 12. Uh, but huge amounts. This is up over 100. This is probably getting close to 200 contributors, individual contributors in a given month. Uh, never had that sort of team at Sun working on. There was never 100 people that were contributing to, JD, to the JDK until it was open sourced. And a large portion of these are all from outside of Oracle. OK. So getting some more practical stuff. How many people have actually uh, tried to build OpenJDK yourself? Maybe it's one of the new ones? All right, so we got one. It's really easy now. Uh, if the reason why you weren't doing it was because you thought it might be complicated, that's all been solved. Initially, when they open sourced it, the build process was a little heinous. Uh, lots of different steps that you had. This is really all there is to it now. You clone it. You run this script that gets the remaining pieces in, in source. You configure it and run make and you get a JVM out the other side. So it's really not difficult to pull down the latest JDK 11 stuff if you want to try that, run a build, and you've got that working. So I'd recommend giving that a shot. If you just want the newest versions of Java and you don't necessarily want to build it for your platform or tweak it or hack it, uh, folks are familiar with the op Adopt Open JDK project? There's a couple. AdoptOpenJDK.net, I believe it is. Um, you Google, it'll be easy to find. They are doing builds of all of these leading edge repositories from the OpenJDK project, adding more over time. Uh, and, the, the, and I've been trying to get some more configurations. There's, for example, the Shenandoah GC, which is sort of like Red Hat's G1. Uh, there is the, the Graal JIT. I'd like to be able to do a build that just uses the new Graal JIT, the, the pure Java one. Uh, and they do have head builds of most of these as well. So you can track day-to-day -day development of all the different various OpenJDK projects. And it's about as simple as it could possibly be. You take a look here. This is the main page that you will see when you go to op adoptopenjdk.net. Uh, you pick what platform. You can actually uh, use the IBM OpenJ9. They've opened up their v JVM now, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, you can choose either Hotspot or OpenJ9 on whatever platform you happen to be. So easy way to get access to this stuff. And you've got OpenJDK 10. I think OpenJDK 11 is in there. Uh, this is a slightly older slide. OK, so that's OpenJDK. It's out there. You can get access to it. Easy to build. You can take a look around and poke, a poke at it if you want. But that's not the biggest thing. I mean, obviously, getting OpenJDK was huge. But the knock-on effects in the community are what really interest me. So the Java community has always leaned towards open source. Uh, even when we only had a closed source JVM, most people were releasing their libraries into open source. Most people were leveraging open source libraries rather than commercial ones. The whole sun ideal that, that somehow there was going to be this Java Beans marketplace where people went online and downloaded little closed source pieces of Java code, it never happened. We never wanted that. We didn't want to add more commercial dependencies to our applications. So we always used open source. Uh, this is not great for the closed source JDK guys, but it's forced them to up their game a little bit. Uh, 
Uh, and then, of course, beyond that, the different languages for the JVM outside of Java have all been developed open source, all the libraries that we have, uh, and actually now features that are being added to the JVM are usually being done in the open first. So we'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, so of course, Java and JavaScript, the two languages that are actually packed into uh, OpenJDK these days. Uh, Java C became fully open source when it came along with OpenJDK, of course. Uh, but there were obviously many implementations up until then. Uh, the standard is pretty clear. The specification of the class files, how Java works, how it should be compiled. Uh, all of that was, was not too difficult for you know, computer science 101 folks to implement open source Java C compilers. Uh, Rhino was a project that came out of Netscape. Uh, that was one of the first. That was the first non-Java language for the JVM, I believe. Uh, they did this as an effort for their Java-based browser they tried to work on in 1997, 98. Uh, so this actually got imported into the JVM. Never was a particularly fast implementation, especially once we start comparing it to V8 and the newer uh, JavaScript runtimes. Run uh, so Oracle started working uh, after Invoke Dynamic came along on the Nashorn implementation. Uh, this used Invoke Dynamic very heavily. In many benchmarks, it can get close, uh, get close to V8 as far as performance. And this uh, ships with every version of Java since Java 8. But again, all implemented in the open. Uh, Nashorn was not done closed source. It was not intended to be a commercial feature. This was done in the open from the beginning. And this is, this is again, part of the effect of having an open source runtime. It's really hard to make the argument that there's going to be closed source piece that you're going to add to it later on. All right. So other languages. Uh, I mentioned Rhino being part of the Netscape Javagator project. Uh, which never really, yeah, they actually did this. They actually had this. Uh, so they had Netscape Navigator. They thought, hey, this Java thing, we wouldn't have to build it for every platform, right? Well, of course, this was before a JIT. This was before Swing. This is before so many things that would have made a desktop browser usable uh, that this project never really went anywhere. But Rhino survived and became a nice JavaScript implementation we used for years. Uh, Jython, I think, was slightly after this. Uh, so Python was, was popular at the time. Very, of course, still popular, but very popular for uh, uh, interest in the JVM, pulling users away, potentially. Uh, a lot of folks started using Java instead of Python. And so the Jython project was started. That continues to this day, but uh, in the last four or five years, it's been kind of light on updates. There's not a lot of folks working on it. But again, open source implementation of, of Python for the JVM. And then it continued on from there. So in the early 2000s, uh, huge uptick in languages, tons of languages being implemented. This, I think the total number of languages on the JVM is like 300 something now. And that, of course, that's like five JavaScripts and five Rubies and other stuff. But uh, so JRuby is one of the earlier ones, actually. It started in 2001, uh, four or five years before I even got involved with it. They were working on this. Uh, Groovy came along shortly after when uh, so there was actually some Ruby folks, some JRuby interested folks that wanted a more Java friendly syntax. That's where Groovy came from. Uh, of course, Scala, Clojure coming along. Uh, and then beyond that, we've got Kotlin's, we've got Salon's, we've got all sorts of other languages that have come since then. Uh, and like I said, hundreds of languages, open source languages that target the JVM. And in a lot of cases, uh, for example, with the Invoke Dynamic work, because these languages were done open source, we collaborated directly with the JVM engineers. Uh, the way Invoke Dynamic works and optimizes now is in huge part due to back and forth from the JRuby team to the Hotspot JIT team. So being able to look at the code they were working on, show them the code we were working on, it's made a better JVM. So what about some libraries that we've managed to get out of this and, and pull in? Uh, so because OpenJDK now has a more friendly license for incorporating other open source projects, uh, they've been able to actually pull from the community to fill in blanks, fill in gaps in the Java platform. Uh, so Java Util Concurrent, which uh, was added in Java 5, was originally developed as public domain work. And it's still out there, still being maintained as a public domain library separate from the JVM. Uh, but obviously, being public domain, very easy to pull it in. It became part of Java. And now we have the concurrent uh, collections library that we all depend on constantly. Uh, again, Nashorn, like I mentioned, uh, was open source. But they did not build their own bytecode generation. They did not build their own invoke dynamic linking logic. They used libraries from the community. They used the ASM library, which is 
kind of the de facto standard everyone uses for bytecode generation. Uh, and Dynalink was a library written to wrap invoke dynamic, make it easier to build dynamic languages on top of it. Those got incorporated into the JDK uh, under hidden packages, the JDK dot whatever packages. Uh, but again, saved a whole bunch of work because the licenses could be compatible, because there was no trouble pulling it into OpenJDK. Uh, and then, of course, the new the Java, Java 8 date time API, finally giving us a proper API for dates and times, uh, was not directly from Joe to time, but inspired heavily by the work on Joe to time done by the same developers. Uh, and so, again, we're benefiting from an open source community and an open source runtime working together. All right, this one I'm really excited about. I mentioned it briefly before. So, after many years of work, uh, I think. The initial efforts on this have started at least five years ago, uh, initially trying to open source just the JIT or just the GC and so on. Uh, after years of work, IBM has finally open sourced J9. We now have two Java Technology Kit compatible or compliant open source Java runtimes. Now it's going to get exciting. Now it's going to get really interesting. Uh, this was the first uh, non-OpenJDK runtime to be TCK compliant, of course. Uh, and Probably the coolest thing about this is that it pulls in uh, IBM's equivalents to some features we're just now getting on the JVM, like ahead of time compilation, like class data sharing. They've got some very advanced versions of these that are now open source and free for anybody to use. Uh, so having OpenJ enter this community is huge for the platform and for all of us. Really exciting stuff. Uh, the problem here so far, and I, I, I assume this is going to expand, they've only open sourced this officially like three or four months ago. I think it finally came out fully open source. But the only platform you'll be able to use it on most likely is X8, X64 Linux. Uh, unless you have like an S390 somewhere in your house, probably not going to be running it on IBM's mainframes. Uh, so hopefully this will expand over time and we'll be able to get Mac and Windows support and so on. Um, I would recommend definitely starting to test on J9. I think more and more people, especially if you are a library author or if you work on frameworks that other people are using, start throwing J9 into your CI builds. Uh, if you're using Travis, I believe they have an install of OpenJ9 that you can use. Now is a great time to start testing it. Uh, if you're interested in performance, and especially some of the, the startup features that come along with J9, like AOT and AppCDS, uh, their versions of those, uh, you can start doing some benchmarking. Tell the, tell the J9 folks what isn't fast, what isn't working for you. They are literally standing by to hear from folks right now. They want to fix this stuff. Um, and like I said, you can build it on your own, uh, but probably easiest for now to go to uh, adopt OpenJDK, pull down the appropriate build, and give it a shot. Okay, now this is one of my favorite sections. Uh, it's hard to hide things in open source. Uh, now I want to preface this by saying I understand Oracle's a business, and like any business, they uh, want to make money. And so over the years, they've had various attempts to make money off of Java itself. Uh, sometimes that is through licensing, like uh, IBM for years had a license to say that they were officially Java compliant, that they could run the TCK. That was real revenue. Uh, and I don't begrudge them this. There's nothing wrong with Oracle wanting to make money off of Java. They put a lot of resources into it. Um, it's a big part of why they bought Sun in the first place. Uh, but unfortunately, these things are almost always uh, initially developed as closed source offerings. There's a lot of pressure within Oracle to find some cute way to make money off of the Java runtime. Uh, and that just doesn't work for us. Like even if it's a really cool feature, like ahead of time compilation or um, uh, the the new application level CDS class data, data sharing, we're just not going to use it. We don't like to be dependent on some commercial feature. We want to know that we can run everywhere. Uh, so these things did not get picked up. Uh, and this has definitely been, been changing over time. Uh, Oracle has been doing more of this work in the open and seems to be moving away from trying to find a way to monetize the platform. And that's good for us. Uh, so previously, uh, it's worth talking about JRocket here because that's where a lot of interesting stuff is getting into OpenJDK from now. Uh, so JRocket was a, a, a totally new JVM JIT implementation in GC. Uh, started, uh, started being implemented, I think, in the early 2000s. Uh, 
Appeal Virtual Machines, who originally wrote this, were acquired by BEA in 2002, who make WebLogic and so on. And then BEA was acquired by Oracle in about 2008. And there are actually some really compelling features in here. Uh, the JIT is very, very different from the one that's in OpenJDK from Hotspot. Uh, rather than working uh, with what's called the sea of nodes intermediate representation, a, much, a very complicated compiler design that uh, Cliff Click wrote for uh, Hotspot in 2000, 2001. Uh, it has an AST-based JIT. So all of these optimizations and transformations are just tree transforms. See that it's an inlining a method, we grab the AST from that method, throw them both together and optimize it together. A lot of things that it could optimize better than Hotspot, uh, at least when it was still being maintained. Uh, and there were some very cool talks out there of Invoke Dynamic and what it would have been able to do on JRocket. Uh, I think Hotspot has finally caught up with those sorts of optimizations, but JRocket got there really quickly with their architecture. They also had some other wild things like a deterministic garbage collector. And there was a JRocket real time that you could actually have real time guarantees about how long garbage collection pauses were going to be, uh, how, much, how many instructions were actually going to execute for a piece of Java code. Uh, another cool one they had, they had a, uh, uh, a version of JRocket that was hosted directly on the hardware. So you would essentially install like a JRocket OS, and that would be your application server and your whole system without any operating system underneath it. Um, there's a few other folks who've done that, but I think JRocket is probably the only one to, to sell it as a product. Uh, and where it gets interesting is in some of these other cool features that are slowly starting to get into OpenJDK, like Mission Control and Flight Recorder. Uh, shortly after OpenJDK was announced and released and Sun changed over to Oracle, uh, Oracle decided that they were not going to be able to stem the tide of open source. They declared that OpenJDK was the winner. They weren't going to be continuing to work on, on JRocket anymore. Uh, and anything that was cool about JRocket, those compelling little features, they were going to port over and provide in the OpenJDK releases. So. Uh, Oracle JDK 8. Again, Oracle JDK 8 versus, versus Open JDK 8. This was only part of their commercial closed source version of the JDK. Uh, we got Java Flight Recorder. And unfortunately, we had to do something this ugly, which for an open source developer, this is horrifying to do this. Like, turn, I want to use uh, commercial features. Show me, let me use your closed source stuff. We're just, we would not do it. Uh, and I, honestly, I believe that this, feat, this flag itself is just going to disappear in JDK 11 or 12. <laughs> They're, they've not been able to provide a compelling reason why these one-off features for Oracle's JDK are even useful. Uh, so this eventually moved to open source. They gave up on trying to sell this. Uh, nobody was willing to pay for their Java runtime just to get Flight Recorder for example. Uh, and so this moved into open source. Now it's available as a non-commercial feature. And I think that's going to be continuing. The cool stuff that comes along is not going to be tried to lock down by, uh, by Oracle. Unfortunately, we haven't gotten much else. Uh, there's a lot of other cool features in JRocket that are not there yet. Uh, the garbage collectors, for example, the real-time mode, uh, some of the embedded features that they had. And uh, JRocket itself has not been open sourced, which is very disappointing to all the folks that worked on it over the years. They're proud of that work and they'd like to see it out there. So this is one something I think we should still lean on Oracle. Just get just release it. It was all developed closed source in-house. You bought it. You can release it as open source. Uh, we 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 would all benefit from it. Okay, I had mentioned App CDS before. Uh, this is the application specific version of class data sharing. Uh, so class data sharing has been around for quite a while. Uh, I believe either IBM or Apple or both of them came up with this originally for speeding up startup. Uh, Apple initially wanted to support Java as one of their three or four languages that officially you could build Mac applications with. Uh, they eventually did drop that, but in order to solve this startup problem, they worked on their own version of class data sharing. And the idea here is that all of the classes that you load, the structure of them, all of the parsing, all the processing, all the verification can be done once, uh, at least for all the JVM level classes. It really didn't make any sense to be loading dot class files every time, parsing them, verifying that they're structured right, and then loading them into whatever the internal structures were. Uh, class data store would do all that once, dump it into an archive, a hidden archive in the JVM directory, and then you get faster startup for the JVM itself. Uh, so this was expanded to be able to uh, do it specific to an individual application. Uh, let's see what I have here. Okay. 
Yeah, so AppCDS uh, was added into Java 8, Oracle Java 8, uh, about update 40 or so. Uh, and now you could actually do this on a per-application uh, per basis. You could run this through your app, uh, the typical things that you do on the command line or for starting up or for warming up your application, and then it would generate an archive that was just what your app needed to boot up fast. Uh, it was commercial. It was experimental in eight. I believe it was uh, later on made into a commercial flag where you could ex get support for it. Uh, but as of OpenJDK 10, this also is now fully open source, no longer a commercial feature. Uh, so if you've got any quick jobs, uh, command line tools that you use, worth playing with this to try and uh, look at startup time and improving that. Okay. Uh, so, practical use of AppCDS. There are more extensive talks out there, of course, and, and lots of guides on how to do this. Uh, but the basic flags, so you would have these two flags to unlock commercial features. Again, like I say, in Java 10, that shouldn't be necessary. Use AppCDS. Uh, first, you want to have it run your application and dump out all of the class files that it loaded. So it knows just specifically to your app what are the important pieces to have in that class data share archive. Then you generate the shared cache file. You take that class list, have it do a dump of all of the class data into a particular cache file. And from then on, all you have to do is pass this flag to the JVM. Your application should start up significantly faster. Uh, I played with this a little bit on JRuby, and we got anywhere from uh, 25 to 50 percent improvement in our startup time for typical commands. And that's, that's not just like starting up hello world. That's like running some pretty heavy Ruby commands that actually do stuff. So this is, this is very useful. Uh, and like I say, now it's available in JDK 10 as a non-commercial feature. So other things that came along. Uh, Almost all OpenJDK sub-projects now are, are being done in the open. Uh, rather than being something internal to Oracle or some other company, they become top-level projects on the OpenJDK project, uh, and we get to see what's going on. We get to build them, we can contribute and help out uh, and test out features before they're even official. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the work on Invoke Dynamic had a ton of input from the JVM dynamic languages, especially JRuby and Groovy. Uh, we worked very closely with the hotspot JVM guys. I would run a benchmark. It wouldn't perform like I expected. I would make the, tell them to fix it, and then we'd keep going. Uh, but Invoke Dynamic today is in large part uh, what it is because of all of this input. Because we were able to collaborate back and forth, we could see their patches, we could build the latest head version of Invoke Dynamic, uh, and we made a good job of it. Uh, there's more stuff coming along. These things have not made it into a JVM, but they're actively developed in the open. Uh, Panama, the sub-project Panama, uh, is a foreign function interface for the JVM. Uh, some of you folks are probably familiar with the JNA, Java Native Access. It allows you to call into C libraries or load a library and, and deal with it. This is an attempt to do that at the JVM level, to have it be part of OpenJDK, so we all get to use the same library. And even better than that, rather than just making these calls down through JNI and making a call into a C library, because it's part of the JVM, the JIT can know about it, it can optimize these calls, make them much faster, so you actually can call from Java to C without all that extra overhead. Uh, this is coming along as a project, you can check it out and build it and try it today. Uh, of course, we want to take better advantage of GPUs. That's been hard to do with the JVM JITs. Uh, so there's work on uh, Project Sumatra, which is support for GPU uh, processing units of various shapes and sizes, vectorization of mathematic operations. Uh, and this, again, is also done in open source uh, and interestingly leverages the same Graal compiler that came out of Maxine. Uh, I found out very recently, a couple months ago, there is work on doing coroutines. Anybody played with Go and Go routines? Or used Python and its generators and so on? Well, this is something that's been practically impossible to do efficiently on the JVM. Uh, to do a little coroutine or a little generator, the only way to have it be restartable is to run it in a separate thread. And if you're going to have 100,000 coroutines, like you might have 100,000 Go routines live in a given process, that obviously doesn't work if they're a thread each. This is an effort to build real coroutine support into the JVM. So the JIT knows about it, the GCs know about it, all the optimizations happen, and we can do 100,000 little threadlets without spinning up 100,000 threads. Um, and this is coming along, I think, uh, very recently they've actually started to get the uh, enter a coroutine and then 
branch out of it, uh, pause it, and come back working. Okay, and probably the biggest deal, uh, this past fall Oracle announced that they were no longer going to be doing a closed source commercial version of OpenJDK. It is just OpenJDK now. They have their own binary build, but they're not going to continue going with the commercial version of OpenJDK as an effort. So I think we won, really. All right, I've mentioned Graal a bunch of times uh, because I'm super excited about this project. Anybody familiar with Graal or played with it yet? Okay, there's a couple folks that know some about it. Uh, so Graal was originally the JIT compiler and some rel related code uh, that came out of the Maxine VM, that Java in Java that Sun Labs worked on. Uh, so because Maxine initially was developed in the open, Graal managed to stay open. It was never wrapped up into an op a closed source project. Uh, so we have now a pure Java JIT that's of a very high quality and fully open source that we can play around with and tweak if we want to. Uh, these days, it's actually comparable to C2, uh, the, the server compiler on Hotspot, uh, and in many ways it actually goes beyond. Uh, we're starting to see some huge performance gains uh, in JRuby, for example, that I'll, I'll show in a minute. Uh, it is actually included as part of the Linux OpenJDK 9. Uh, the AOT feature that they shipped with Java 9 leverages Graal to do all of its compilation. So. Graal came along for the ride, and it's in OpenJDK 9. Uh, that AOT support has been expanded to other platforms. Uh, now, as of JDK 10, I believe all of the official OpenJDK builds also include Graal. So you can start flipping it on. Uh, and this has also spawned a number of sub-projects that I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, it's been developed for a long time. Like I say, Maxine started in 2005. Uh, the efforts on this JIT, I think, were around... 2008, 2009 time frame, maybe. Um, kind of trying to follow the same uh, structure as Hotspot. Uh, so it's, it's close to production ready if it's not already there. Uh, there. I mentioned Chris Thallinger, who's done a lot of work on it. Uh, he actually is in charge of running Graal in production at Twitter. And the number of machines that are at Twitter are using Graal instead of Hotspot goes up by the day. And they're seeing great gains from it, too. Uh, so, practical use. How many people want to try out Graal? Well, uh, it's fairly simple to do. Like, if you have, if you have Linux Java 9, uh, there's a simple flag, or pull in Java 10, it's the same thing. Uh, but there's this feature added in Java 9 called the JVM Compiler Interface. Uh, and this is a set of interfaces that you can implement and a few command line uh, tweaks that you can make to, say, don't use Hotspot as your JIT anymore. Use whatever I've got. And you know, since you all have JITs, you can plug in your own JITs. I would recommend trying out Graal. Uh, but yes, any JIT could be plugged in here. You can even have, add your own JIT that just does nothing and just logs it if you want. Uh, fairly easy uh, API to implement. So like I said uh, earlier, Graal shipped with the ahead of time compilation support that came along in Java 9. Uh, and so it was available as part of J Java 9. Uh, here is all you really need to know to turn it on. Uh, this is still considered an experimental option, the JVMCI API itself, uh, but unlock experimental VM options, enable JVMCI, and use the JVMCI compiler. And that will basically pick out Graal and switch to using that. So, how good is Graal? I mentioned that we're seeing some gains on JRuby. Uh, we've only, uh, only started benchmarking it heavily lately because it's easy to get at with the JDK now. So, uh, a really simple benchmark, uh, which for Ruby is surprisingly heavy, uh, 100 million iteration loop. Uh, because we're a dynamic language, we're using full-on objects for every one of our numbers. So it's much more expensive than doing a loop in Java. We've been waiting for the JVMs to optimize that stuff away. So on Hotspot uh, JDK 10, uh, it takes about 0.73 seconds per iteration. So that's, it's still not slow. We're significantly faster than the standard C implementation of Ruby. Uh, but it's nowhere near what Java would be in this case. And for a simple loop, the whole thing should be able to optimize away. Now we get a lot closer with Graal. So this is uh, over double performance just by switching from Hotspot to Graal. We change nothing else in JRuby and we get this kind of improvements. Uh, the main reason is one of the key features that's better in Graal, uh, the escape analysis support. Uh, anybody ever looked at escape analysis or tried to, to play with it in the JVM? The idea behind escape analysis is that if you allocate an object within a, a given piece of code, and you use that object, and then you walk away from it, you don't keep it around or put it in memory or stuff it into uh, any global state, well, why do we need the object? 
All we need is the contents of the object. So escape analysis detects that and says, OK, well, you're not actually using the string object outside of this scope. All you're doing is using these bytes, these characters that are inside it. Well, I'm just going to have those characters be on the native stack. Just those raw characters will be available. Don't allocate the object, save a whole bunch of performance. And like in JRuby, where all of our numeric algorithms are all object-based, we get a huge bonus from this. Um, another benchmark that I run frequently is a, a Mandelbrot generator, Mandelbrot generator, uh, and that improves anywhere from five to six times. So if you've got any object-heavy code, if you're using tons of variable argument lists, var args, uh, or if you're just churning through numeric objects or collections, Graal may be able to sweep that stuff away, and you might see an immediate performance improvement like the Twitter folks have. Definitely worth checking out. Uh, I mentioned that this came along with AOTC. Anybody played with the Java 9 AOT c compiling stuff? It's worth checking out. Uh, again, only being on Linux x64 kind of limited it. Now it's expanding to other platforms. Uh, but this is based on Graal, and it provides an ahead-of-time compiler for your Java code. Uh, it started out as closed source. Uh, this was one of those last things that Oracle still thought maybe they were going to make some money on. Uh, I actually even met with some of the developers on this, and I was like, no. No one's going to pay. It's cool. It's cool. And I think you should give me a license. But nobody else is probably going to pay for this. So let's be real here. And uh, I think it was less than a year later I heard the news that they decided they were just going to do it as open source as part of Oracle JDK 9. So again, we're winning. We're winning this fight against closed source features in Java. Uh, OpenJDK 9, this was opened up and released uh, for Linux, expanding to other platforms, like I mentioned. Uh, and it's, it's still kind of early days for this. It was implemented as a quick one-off version of it, and then the, the guy who worked on it, Chris, left and went to Twitter to do Graal stuff. Uh, so it's improving slowly over time. Uh, now that we also have the idea of JDK modules, there's a hope that we can probably JIT individual modules, or, or ahead of time compile individual modules, get faster boot up performance, faster execution performance for those things too. So nobody here apparently had used it. It's, it's pretty easy. I'll show you the, the instructions to try it out. Uh, so you specify a .so or a DLL on Windows. Uh, I'm not sure about the, the, the AOT support on Windows yet, but you specify a shared library file name uh, and a list of jar files, class files you want to compile. Once you've got that SO, you just pass this flag to the JVM, and it will now use, it will start up with your native compiled code. Uh, this obviously avoids a lot of the, this avoids uh, all of the class loading logic, all of the compiling logic, and actually skips kind of into that first level of JIT. Uh, so you're getting way fat, way, way bumped ahead in the, the whole boot up process uh, by running this. Uh, and one of the nice features about this is even though it ahead of time compiles and creates a binary, the binary contains all the information the JVM needs to keep optimizing it. So you can ahead of time compile, get fast startup, quicker warm up, and eventually still get to full speed execution. So that's great. Um, we played, about, played around with this on JRuby. The gains have been pretty moderate. Uh, we have not tried combining AOT plus class CD, uh, app CDS plus various tweaks that you can use to limit how much it compiles and how much it optimizes. Uh, but it's roughly equivalent to us turning off the C2, the server compiler. That's where most of our warm up and, and slow startup comes from. C2 starts compiling stuff immediately, takes cycles away from the machine. We don't boot up as quickly. If we turn that off, we, we boot up pretty quick or use the AOT stuff. So this is exciting for us since everybody uses command line in the Ruby world. All right, the final project that I want to talk about from the Graal world is Truffle. Uh, so this is an AST-based language framework that's built on top of Graal. Uh, so like JRocket, uh, with its AST-based JIT, it has more uh, potential for optimization. There's things that they can see in the structure of code that's hard to do if you're just using raw bytecode or an intermediate format like Hotspot does. Uh, this also has a, a very high-quality uh, partial evaluation implementation. Uh, so what this can actually do, it will run through the code before it's executing, determine whether maybe you're always using integers or whether you're always using a, a particular uh, collection of strings, and optimize that all away. 
It'll see through how your code is going to execute and produce significantly better code for those cases where it's mostly static, where it can be predicted. Uh, they have their own implementations of JavaScript, Ruby. Uh, I think there's a Python, there's an R, uh, Smalltalk, a, a bunch of others that people are working on based on Truffle. And the performance of the JavaScript and Ruby implementations are, are pretty solid for small, mostly static benchmarks, uh, very similar to V8 Node.js performance. So definitely a competitor for, for JavaScript. Uh, and we're watching the work that they're doing on Ruby, too. And this is another case where we won. Hooray! Ruby and JavaScript were both closed source to begin with. And they were going to say, like, especially with the Ruby thing, I was like, y you guys, no one's ever going to buy a Ruby runtime from you. Like, these guys are, are running off Rails and barely making these, these, the application go with the, the resources they have. There's no way they're going to pay Oracle for a license to a Ruby runtime. So the Ruby runtime got open source very shortly after that conversation. Uh, we actually uh, merged it into JRuby, and it was part of the JRuby project for a long time. Uh, and then later they forked off. Their, their goals were a little bit different. But we collaborated in the same repository for a long time. Uh, and fairly recently, the JavaScript implementation has also been open source. So you've got this Truffle-based JavaScript that's similar performance to a V8, but runs on top of Graal and uses JVM stuff. OK. So moving forward from here, um, and this is marching orders for, for all of you, hopefully. Uh, all the things I've seen today are out there, available for you, non-commercial, no license required. Uh, so try everything out. These Java features, as we know now with Java 10, Java 11, we're going to have Java 27 in just a few years, uh, this stuff is going fast. And these features are going to be popping up really quick. You can stay ahead of this game by pulling down a, uh, a pre-release OpenJDK builds, uh, building your own JDK, looking at some of those side projects I mentioned, like Panama and Sumatra, see how they help. Um, you know, show your supervisors, show your bosses what you can do with some of these new things. Uh, it'll help push those features along and get more resources into them. Uh, very easy to keep up with these things on Adopt Open JDK because it's tracking most of these builds. Also has the head builds of just the basic JDK, Open JDK itself. So you can see all of the newest stuff that's going into the master builds, head builds. Uh, I would recommend trying Graal out immediately. It's so easy to flip that switch and start running an application with it. Um, give it a shot because uh, the, here's, here's, the, here's my controversial statement. I believe this is the future of Open JDK. Uh, the big, the huge C++ implementation of Hotspots JIT, it's just too much. You, it takes like a year for a new developer to get into the code base and understand how it works. It's too unwieldy for them to make new changes to it. Every time they make a change, they have to re-verify all the memory aspects of it. Um, it's, it's just a mess. It's really difficult for them to keep up with, hot sp with, with the Grawl work right now. Uh, so I think Grawl is the way to go. Start testing your applications on it now. You might, you might be able to cut a server out of your server farm because the performance improves that much. There's real savings, real money to be made by trying out some of these features. OK. And of course, if I, was, if I didn't ask you to get involved, I would not be a good Red Hat employee. Uh, these are all open source projects. You can just go out, look at them, build them, play around with them, submit bugs, uh, talk with the developers. Almost all of these have uh, forums or chat rooms that you can go into and talk about Panama, talk about the GPU work. Uh, and there's a wide range of projects and tasks. There's small things that you can do for OpenJDK, very easy to find little things, little bits and pieces to work on, all the way up to if you like compiler technology and are interested in Graal, it's a very readable code base. It's all in Java, plain old Java, and you can understand a whole lot about how the JIT works with very little uh, initial effort. Uh, and specifically, I'm standing by to help out with some of these projects that I've got my hands in. Um, if you're interested in Ruby language implementation or any of the stuff we're doing with JRuby, let me know. I'll find something that you can help out with it's at any, at any uh, skill level. Uh, the FFI work in Panama is actively being done right now. If you have interest in calling out to native libraries, they want to hear from you. They definitely want to hear from you, and they ask me about this stuff all the time. Uh, and then, of course, others. You know, want to try doing some GPU stuff. You've got some heavy math work you're doing in the app. Try out Sumatra. See if you can get a gain from it. Uh, and we need to keep the pressure on. So we've won a lot of battles as far as free open source Java, uh, getting OpenJDK itself, uh, getting Oracle to drop their commercial stuff. Uh, but there's 
there's still some uh, interesting folks out there that we might like to see open source. I'd like to see an open source Zing. Uh, it was Azul's runtime. They've got some very cool uh, garbage collector and JIT technologies. This is probably never going to happen as long as they're doing good business, and I more power to them if they're able to get licensees for it. But if this was open source, it would be better for everyone in the community. There's no way to argue against that. Uh, similarly, the, uh, the ahead of time support in the Excelsior JET compiler is significantly better than what we have in the, the JAOT stuff in Java 9. I'd love to see that become open source so we can all benefit from it. Uh, but again, they're a business and they're doing, a good, they're doing good work uh, with a commercial piece of software. I don't begrudge them the right to make money. I just think the community would be better if we keep the pressure on, make sure that Java stays open source and, and all the new stuff comes along with it. All right, and that's all I got. Thank you. I, I have a separate question related to this picture. Do you all have a beer fest like every week here or what? Because like I just walk around the city and every time I'm here, there's a beer fest. So we were over at the Berlin Beer Fest uh, with like 120 taps or something and uh, I met a friend. So. It's just, yeah, I know. All right. That's why, that's why I figured. I figured if I just walk long enough, I'll find a beer festival. So, all right. Uh, any questions? That's why I wanted to ask. But Perfect. Yep. <laughs> sure. Go ahead. Uh, when I understand you correctly, you said since Oracle Java 8, JDK and Oracle, JDK are the same. Uh, Java 9. It was just this fall, I think, that they did it. Uh, there was still an Oracle JDK 8, uh, but now if you go to Oracle's download, it's... It's identical. It's the same thing. They don't do their own commercial nine. Okay. Right. Okay. So, so uh, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Um, so the question is about uh, why there was even a closed source Oracle JDK to begin with, and why why some applications, libraries, whatever, sometimes asked you to use Oracle JDK. Well. The truth is, the only real difference in Oracle JDK was this 1% of commercial features. The app CDS stuff, um, the AOT when that was still closed source, uh, a few other internal things like G1 was a commercial feature, the G1 garbage collector was a commercial feature for a while. And by the time Java 9 rolled around, there really was nothing left that was in the closed source Oracle JDK. There was no reason for them to do a separate one anymore. Uh, now that those features are all out, now we've just got one JDK to deal with. Uh, to answer the question about why a lot of people preferred the Oracle JDK or required it for an application, I think it's just surface area. Um, not having to test on both Oracle JDK and OpenJDK when you know most people are just going to use the Oracle download anyway. Um, and because they're up until this change, there was no official OpenJDK build that you could download. You could build it yourself or you could download Oracle JDK. And so I think a lot of libraries and applications just said, well, this is the one we can get access to easily. That's the one we'll test on. That's the one we recommend. But it's, it was all the same code, essentially. There's very little difference. All right. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> you, you mentioned several times that Oracle um, does not charge any, um, some technology anymore. But if, um, um, Oracle announced that uh, next year they want to charge when you use um, classic o um, Java client technologies mm. um, after the January uh, um, update. Uh, if you want to use WebStart or um, Applets or um, right. uh, Java X, uh, it is uh, you can only use it uh, on a Client uh, support version when you uh, buy the, uh, um, the business. Um, right. Pieces. Right. Uh, so, so, uh, several questions. Is there any um, uh, support of um, Java 8, 9, or 10 uh, in an uh, open source uh, version after uh, this year? Right. And, only Oracle that uh, wanted to drop those technologies and they decided it by their own. It is not part of Java anymore. And is there any chance that uh, technologies like WebStart or uh, JavaFX uh, will come into uh, the, uh, the OpenJDK? 
Okay. Okay. So questions about uh, technologies like WebStart, JavaFX, that Oracle is now not going to support in the open source side, right? And I think there's, there's a distinction we have to say here. These features are in OpenJDK, like the cat's out of the bag. JavaFX is GPL open source. Um, Java WebStart never has been. Uh, the Java web, web uh, browser plugin never has been open sourced. So there's a difference between they're pulling support or pulling the, the, the project itself, or they're just not going to officially support it anymore. Uh, you have to get your own support or pay something. That's largely where things are going. I think the, the, the admission from Oracle is that there just aren't that many people that are using Java for desktop stuff. We, we've all known this for years. It's been slowly dying as a desktop technology. Uh, and so they don't want to be putting as many resources into JavaFX or Swing or whatnot. So if you need, if you need those and you want support, you're going to need to pay extra for that. Uh, I also should say, this is, so for example, Java Web Start, a lot of people aren't doing Web Start anymore. It never really picked up and never, there's not that many apps out there that go through Web Start to do anything. They don't want to spend the time on it. Uh, some of these pieces, like Web, I think Web Start, I think the browser plugin, do have uh, iced tea versions, so you have access to those. Uh, if you are worried about support, I know that uh, Azul has their own build of OpenJDK going back to six, actually, and they have support contracts. So you can get support for older Java versions, things that Oracle says they're not going to support, going through, say, a Red Hat or an Azul. And of course, Red Hat, we've got uh, iced tea, and it's part of Red Hat Linux, so you just Get your Red Hat subscription. We'll support anything on that JVM that you want. So there are options. Uh, but you can still use them. Swing and, and JavaFX and stuff, they may get pulled out as separate modules, but they are open source. They're going to be around forever now. Yes? Good question. What is left for Oracle in the business model? Well, if they don't continue to contribute to it, they will lose control of one of the crown jewels of their, you know, the, all, of, all of their projects they have at Oracle. Like, this has got to be one of the most visible things out there. Like, database, Java, maybe to a lesser extent, Solaris, WebLogic, those sorts of things are the key products that they've got, that they build everything else on top of. Um, so for Oracle, keeping Java going and keeping it moving forward is good for their bottom line, because everything they do is built on Java. I mean, not the database itself, but all of their applications, all of their business tools, Java. So they need a good Java runtime. And they also don't want these many dozens of contributors in the outside world to start making the decisions for where the OpenJDK goes. They need to stay involved in this. They own the copyrights for the, or the, the trademarks for Java, as we've learned from the stupid Android lawsuits. Uh, they, they will not let this go. I, I think they're just finally starting to realize that there's a balance they can strike between having an open source thing and having a good bottom line result of working on it. Yes? Well, we were talking about a lot of features and a lot of good stuff going on in the, um, in the open source world. For me, for example, who is uh, quite not that experienced in all that stuff, if there are any blog or stuff like that, you would recommend even your own blog or stuff like that? Ah, like sure. Listing all those features, which is updating, well, there is a new feature by like that, and these switches, so any type of overview to get in all into that stuff, and well, okay, things like that, and okay, <sighs> some comparison. Right. Right, right. So what's, what's out there for overviews, blog, blogs, and whatnot that, that talk about this stuff? Well, there are, there's obviously for any individual project like Panama or uh, the, the AOT, there's somebody that's blogging about it. As far as aggregating those, I think on OpenJDK, there are some links to individual blogs. Uh, if you go to openjdk.java.net or whatever, whatever the URL is, you will see all the projects listed too. Uh, you can just click into Panama. It'll give you information about the spec that they're working on. It will link to key developers that are working on that. And then you can find out more about it. Uh, a single place that talks about all these features, I, this is kind of it right here, right now. Or you know, look at the, what people are talking about at, at Geekon or other Java conferences. Um, but this is something I'd like to do more blogging about. I haven't had a chance to play with these features enough to blog about them yet. Uh, but they're all going to have huge impact on the way we do JRuby, so 
I'll, I'll hopefully get some more blog posts out about this stuff. Yes, in the back. Uh, project with Amber. 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 Yeah. Um, which one is Amber? I, I I forget which one that is. There's so many names now. The what? what? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. That that I'm I'm very excited about that one. There's been some efforts to do that in other forms on other JVMs. Um, there's also a, a project Metropolis you might have heard of, which is an, a yet another attempt to, to do more of the JVM in Java, trying to get rid of some of the other native pieces. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I remember, I'm literally excited about all of the OpenJDK projects. There's all, like everything that I've ever wanted for the JDK is in there somewhere. There's a, there's a JDK pro project or a patch for uh, doing proper tail calls. Uh, there's a, a JDK patch for, there's the coroutine stuff. All of these things that I've needed uh, are, are just out there and waiting for folks to try them or contribute. Yeah, and, and Amber's one of them too, for sure. Anything else? Okay. So so I, I don't know exactly what's in their build of what they call Graal VM. Uh, obviously, it's based mostly on OpenJDK and Graal, which are open source. Uh, but at various times when I've talked to the folks in the labs group and the VM group, uh, they're, they're still looking for ways to try and make some money off of the technology. Uh, and I believe in the, the published binary version of the Graal VM, there are a couple additional optimizations and tweaks that they've done internally, things that they may, they'll probably end up having to open source anyway. Um, but otherwise, I don't know what all is different than that. It, 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 I don't know what's different in the Graal VM versus JDK 9 with Graal shipped. Uh, they have some of their other languages that you can pull down, but it's still 99% just open JDK. It's like OpenJDK, where Graal is the default, is really what it is for the most part. Yeah, so you can check it out. And then if you want to try out their JavaScript implementation, that's probably the easiest way to get at it. You install a Graal VM, there's a command you can use that will install the JavaScript, and then you can play with it. And you get a JS command or something like that. Anything else? All right, well, thank you for coming out. <laughs>